Hey there folks, Zach here. Our second major topic in week five concerned gradients and directional derivatives. The motivation for this section was pretty straightforward, and I'll remind you of this momentarily, but the underlying mathematics is very rich and incredibly pretty. It's one of my favorite topics in multivariable calculus. To remind you of the content of this section, I'd like you to think back to our lessons on partial derivatives. Back in week three, we learned how to measure the instantaneous rate of change of our function as we move from a given point AB in the direction of the positive x-axis or in the direction of the positive y-axis. The rate of change in the positive x direction is the slope of this tangent line here, the partial derivative of f with respect to x at AB. Likewise, the rate of change in the positive y direction is the slope of this tangent line. It's the partial derivative of f with respect to y at AB. For the discussion to come, it will be helpful to think about our movements here in terms of vectors. The slope of this tangent line is the rate of change as we move in the direction of the vector 1, 0, whereas the slope of this tangent line is the rate of change as we move in the direction of 0, 1. But what if we want to move in a completely different direction? Maybe instead of moving from a, b in the direction of 1, 0, or in the direction of 0, 1, we choose to move with some other unit vector u, say this guy right here. If you think about it, we're looking for a derivative of our function as we move along this red line. Since this line passes through AB and moves in the direction of U, its vector equation is given by XY equals AB plus SU, where here S is just a parameter that can take on any real number. As we change the value of S, we trace out this red line. When S is zero, we're exactly at the point AB. Okay, now the values of our function as we move along this red line are given by f of xy equals f of, well, a plus u1s, b plus u2s. These are the values of x and y on our line. We're now dealing with a function of just one variable, s, and we're asking for the derivative of that function at the point a, b, which is where s equals zero. This gives us a way to describe our rate of change. The rate of change we're asking for in this question is really the derivative of the single variable function f of a plus u1s b plus u2s when s equals zero. We denote this quantity by du f at ab, which we refer to as the directional derivative of f in the direction of the unit vector u. Using a unit vector here is super important. Now I'm not going to say too much more about this formula for a directional derivative. You can check out the examples in Mobius to see how it can be used, but what I believe is much more interesting is the connection between directional derivatives and the gradient vector. Let's take a look. Well here it is folks, one of my favorite results from our course. It turns out that if you're dealing with a function f that's differentiable at ab, and you're trying to measure the rate of change as you move from ab in the direction of a unit vector u, well then that rate of change, the directional derivative, is simply the dot product of u and the gradient of f. Now this is pretty amazing. It tells us that if we know the gradient of our function, that is, if we know the partial derivatives at a, b, we can very quickly calculate the rate of change in any direction. Very cool stuff. In addition to this being a quick way to compute directional derivatives, as we'll see in the following problem, this result helps us to understand some of the fundamental properties of the gradient vector. To see what I mean, I'm going to use our dot product formula from linear algebra to express the right-hand side of this equation as the norm of the gradient times the norm of u times cos theta, where here theta is the angle between the gradient and our direction vector. Note that since u is a unit vector, this norm is equal to 1, and hence the right-hand side is equal to the norm of the gradient times cos theta. Okay, now why is this interesting? Well, let's think about it. The gradient at AB is fixed. It doesn't change. But by changing the angle theta, that is, by changing the direction in which we move from AB relative to the gradient, we'll get different values for our directional derivative. The directional derivative depends on the angle theta. More specifically, it depends on cos theta. But hang on a sec. Cos theta can only get so large or so small. It always lies between plus and minus 1. This means that our directional derivative can also only get so large or so small. So let's think. 
How large can our directional derivative possibly get? The biggest value will occur when cos theta is equal to 1, or equivalently, when theta equals 0 radians. This means that the directional derivative is largest when we move in the same direction as the gradient vector. The gradient points us in the direction of steepest ascent. This is probably the most important property of the gradient vector. It acts sort of like an elevation compass at AB. If you imagine the graph of our function representing a mountain and a hiker standing on the mountain above the point AB, the gradient tells him the direction to move to increase his elevation most rapidly. So now we know how to find the direction of steepest ascent. But what's the value of the directional derivative in this direction? Well, if we move with the gradient, then cos theta equals 1. And hence, the right-hand side of this equation is simply the norm of our gradient vector. The norm of the gradient tells us the maximum rate of change we can experience at AB. This formula leads to some other interesting conclusions as well. For instance, perhaps it can tell us how to make the directional derivative as small as possible. To do that, we should minimize the value of cos theta. The minimum value will occur when cos theta is minus 1, or equivalently, when theta equals pi radians. That is, the directional derivative is as small as possible, as largely negative as possible, when we move 180 degrees from the gradient vector in the complete opposite direction. That is, minus the gradient points us in the direction of steepest descent. So going back to our hiker, if he now wishes to go down the mountain as quickly as possible, he should move from AB in the exact opposite direction of his compass, in the exact opposite direction of the gradient. What's the value of the directional derivative as we move in this direction? Well, when cos theta is minus 1, the right-hand side of this equation is minus the norm of the gradient. The negative of the gradient's length tells us the most negative rate of change we can achieve at AB. The last interesting case I'd like to mention occurs when theta equals pi over 2. When this happens, cos theta will be 0, and hence so too will be our directional derivative. That is, the rate of change of our function will be 0 if we move in a direction that's perpendicular to the gradient vector. But hang on a sec, let's think back to our hiker. If our hiker's elevation isn't changing as he starts moving in this direction, then essentially he's walking along a level curve. The direction vector u is pointing us along a level curve. Since the gradient vector in this case is perpendicular to u, what do we conclude? Well, it means that the gradient vector at AB is orthogonal to the level curve through AB. You can see that in our picture. This is an important property of the gradient that's referred to in Mobius as the orthogonality theorem. Okay, we've talked lots of theory, now let's try an example together. In this problem, we're considering the function fxy equals x e to the minus y minus y cos x. In part a, we'd like to know, from the origin, in which direction can we move to maximize our directional derivative? In addition, what is this maximum value? In part b, we're looking to compute a directional derivative of our function at 0, 0 in the direction of the vector 1, 2. And finally in c, from the origin, in which directions can we move to increase our function at a rate of 1? At this point, I encourage you to pause the video and attempt whatever part of this problem speaks to you. Note that a, b, and c are all independent, so start wherever you like. All right, let's take a look at part A. We want to maximize the directional derivative of our function at 0, 0. Hmm, didn't we just recently discuss maximizing directional derivatives? We did. We said that the directional derivative of a differentiable function will be greatest if we move in the direction of the gradient vector. Note that this function fxy is indeed differentiable, and you'll see that in a moment when we compute its partial derivatives. So let's go ahead and write this down. The directional derivative of f at 0, 0 is largest in the direction of the gradient vector at 0, 0. Let's see if we can compute this gradient. The gradient is the vector of partial derivatives. So if I differentiate this function with respect to x, I get e to the minus y plus y sine x. If I differentiate with respect to y, I get minus x e to the minus y 
minus cos x. And I'm going to evaluate this thing at 0, 0. Now before I do that, take a quick look at these partial derivatives. These are nice continuous functions. And therefore, since my partial derivatives are continuous, my function f is differentiable. Okay, so all of the steps we're doing here are valid since we're working with a differentiable function. Now when I plug in 0, 0, I'm going to get the vector 1 minus 1. That's our gradient. Our directional derivative will be largest if we move in this direction, in the direction of 1 minus 1. Now some of you might be thinking, well Zach, this isn't a unit vector. Didn't you say we needed to use a unit vector? It's true, unit vectors are important when it comes to directional derivatives. If we wanted to actually do any computations with this vector, we would have to work with a unit vector. But since here we're just asking for the general direction in which we should move, 1 minus 1 is fine. Uh, what about the second part of this problem, where it asks for the maximum value of our directional derivative? Well, if you think back to a couple slides ago, we said that the maximum value of our directional derivative will be the norm of our gradient vector. So the max value is the norm of the vector 1 minus 1, which is the square root of 1 squared plus minus 1 squared. That's the square root of 2. Moving on to part b, we need to find the directional derivative of our function at 0, 0 in the direction of the vector 1, 2. Now I guess we could do this using the definition of a directional derivative from the very first slide of our lesson, but since we're dealing with a differentiable function, we have the full power of our directional derivative formulas. I think there's probably a simpler way. Remember, we learned a few slides ago that the directional derivative at, in this case, 0, 0, and in the direction of a vector u, is given by the dot product of the gradient at 0, 0, and the direction vector. We actually computed the gradient in part a. It was the vector 1 minus 1. As for our direction vector, is it this guy here, the vector 1, 2? No! Remember, the direction vector in these computations has to be a unit vector. The norm of u is equal to 1. So we want a unit vector pointing in this same direction. We have to unitize that vector first. u is going to be 1 divided by the norm of the vector 1, 2 times the vector 1, 2. It's 1 divided by the square root of 1 squared plus 2 squared times 1, 2. That's 1 over root 5, 2 over root 5. Okay, from here we're ready to wrap up the problem. The directional derivative is the dot product of these two vectors. That's 1 minus 1 dot 1 over root 5, 2 over root 5. If you do the dot product here, you should get minus 1 over root 5. That's our directional derivative. All right, we made it to the last part of our problem. Here, we're looking for all directions in which we can move from 0, 0 to increase our function at a rate of 1. Okay, so we know the directional derivative we hope to get. We want our directional derivative to be 1, and we want to figure out which direction vectors will achieve this. Hmm, do we have any formulas that relate a directional derivative and its direction vector? I think we probably do, right? We have that dot product formula. The directional derivative of f at 0, 0 is really the dot product of the gradient of f with the direction vector u, the thing we're trying to find. We actually already know our gradient from part a, right? It's the vector 1 minus 1. And we know what the directional derivative should be in the end. It should be 1. Okay, so we're looking for a vector u whose dot product with 1 minus 1 gives us a value of 1. In order to work with this information, maybe it makes sense to unpack u into its components. Let's say u is the vector u1, u2. This dot product tells us that u1 minus u2 must be equal to 1. Now, are there any other conditions on this vector u? I think there probably are, right? If we're using this formula, we better be working with a unit vector. So in addition to this dot product equation being true, we also need that the norm of u be equal to 1. So in other words, the square root of u1 squared plus u2 squared should be equal to 1. These two equations together give us a system to work with. We're going to try to solve this system for the components u1, u2. From the first equation, we see that u1 is really 1 plus u2. And so we can use that in the second equation. 
Turning to equation two, if I write u1 is one plus u2, I get the square root of one plus u2 squared plus u2 squared equals one. If I square both sides to get rid of that root and maybe expand this binomial, I get one plus two u2 plus two u2 squared is equal to one. At this point, I can cancel the ones on both sides and I can probably factor two u2. I get two u2 times one plus u2 is equal to zero. And from here, there are only a couple possibilities. Either u2 is equal to zero or u2 is equal to minus one. What does that tell us about our other component, u1? Ah, well, u1 is one plus u2. So if u2 is zero, then u1 is gonna be one. And likewise, if u2 is minus one, u1 is gonna be zero. So we actually get two solutions to this system, the vector zero minus one and the vector one, zero. And there you go. These two vectors are gonna give us the desired directional derivative. It turns out you can also solve this problem using that cosine formula for the directional derivative. I encourage you to think about how such a solution might proceed.